Your spirit had awakened our lifeless hearts to see the King in brilliant glory revealed in majesty. so true. There is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Well, good morning, Hickman Church. It's good to see you on this cloudy morning. I don't know about you, love the weather. It's cool, it's refreshing, and uh, I know we're in for a sharp change later this week as the temperature dramatically changes, but um, good morning to you. We are here to welcome our Lord and Savior, or to worship our, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we want to welcome you as guests to be a part of this fellowship this morning. But speaking of fellowship feast, 
We've got an opportunity to come up um, on Sunday, April 21st at 6 p.m. We're going to have a family potluck. And so if this is the first that you've heard of it, you're not too late. There's still opportunity to be able to sign up to bring your favorite dish. Just go to hickmanchurch.org, and you can sign up you and your family and designate are you going to bring a main dish, a dessert, or a salad. But this is going to be an opportunity for us to come together as a church family to fellowship with one another, to break bread, and be devoted to the apostles' teaching and prayer. Dedication celebration. There is a lot of festivities happening soon here on campus. On April 28th, after the second service, we are going to do a dedication of the playground and the basketball court, and we're going to celebrate the Lord's provision to us here at Hickman Church. You're not going to want to miss out on this event. It's going to be after the second service. Lunch will be provided. You need to bring nothing except maybe some tennis shoes. And maybe some athletic shorts or pants because we're going to have a three-on-three basketball tournament. So when you sign up for lunch, you're also going to uh, let us know, will you be participating in the tournament? Now, we're going to have a juniors division, an intermediate, and a seniors division. Juniors is going to be fifth grade and below. Our intermediate is going to be sixth through eighth. And then our seniors are going to be high school through seniors however far you want to take that. So not only will we have uh, the basketball game, but there's also going to be games in Kinzer Park. So there's something for everybody to participate. And of course, we always need cheerleaders. So again, go to hickmanchurch.org, sign up today. As far as signups, we have our men's conference coming up May 3rd and 4th. That is our Iron Sharpens Iron Conference. And hopefully you as men have already signed up at isiconference.com, but really what we're looking for is we're calling all the ladies. Ladies, we need your help. We cannot have a men's conference without your support and with your help, and so we need volunteers, and there are various ways you can serve and various time slots as well, and so after service, there's going to be a table right outside. Go see Tia Porter at the table, and she will give you a different way that you can serve and a time slot that works for your schedule. But please come, be a part of that. It is so blessed to be able to uh, have you serve our men faithfully as you do year after year. If the table's not convenient for you, again, you can go to hickmanchurch.org to sign up for that as well. well. I'd like to call up my brother Jacob to talk about Team Fiji. Team Fiji. Jacob. Good morning, Hickman Community Church. I'm excited to announce to you about the STM, the short-term missions trip, the team going to Fiji August 10th through the 22nd this year. And the team consists of 10 of us with Betty and Austin, Miguel and Deborah, Will and John, Josh Taylor, Josh Wright, Kat, my wife, and myself. And our aim is really to be a blessing to the Sihusen family. Michael and his wife, Jordan, and their three kids, Taj, Tori, and Kai. And with that blessing, that's where the missionary is our mission. Along with that, we'd like to take part in the Fiji Bible College there, as well as local outreach and also outer island ministry. Please pray for the team over these next four months I know our aim is to be a blessing to the Sihusans, but if our hearts aren't right as a team, then we're not going to be much of a blessing. There are three areas that you could pray for us in. The first is that the team's um, spiritual growth, but also our unity amongst the team, but also the Lord's protection over us. Thank you very much. Well, this morning we have the opportunity to formally welcome Micah Pritchett as a new member of Hickman Community Church. And so I'd like to ask Pastor Andrew to come up and to lead us in that time. Grace and peace, brothers and sisters. Uh, Well, as Josh said, we have an opportunity to have a formal welcome of a new member here. 
uh, as you know, I've said before, or if you're visiting, you haven't heard before, uh, but to draw someone in or, or formally welcome someone to church membership is not a, an act that grants anyone any special merit or privilege before the Lord, uh, but rather this is someone making public their spiritual union with Christ and really making practical their connection to the universal body of Christ by connecting to a local body of Christ. And I like to say church membership is really a mutual understanding of commitment, a mutual understanding of commitment. So Micah Pritchett is going to be formally welcome. Michael, Micah, why don't you come up, please? The elders, please join me as well. Uh, Micah has been uh, affirmed by you, the congregation, at our recent members meeting, and now we want to officially uh, welcome him uh, into the membership. So I'm going to move off to the side here. Uh, Micah, you want to stand over here for me, would you? Yeah, so I'm going to ask Micah a series of questions. And Micah, please respond with a holy and hearty yes after these questions. So, have you, by God's grace, been led to repent of your sin, placed your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and made a public confession of your faith through baptism? Are you in agreement with all that is contained in Hickman Community Church's statement of faith and bylaws? Yes. Do you covenant to support the testimony of Hickman Community Church by faithfully attending church services, diligently guarding the truth, living a holy life, and giving cheerfully of your time and money for the sustaining of the work of the gospel? Yes. And will you seek to protect the unity of the church by acting in love towards other members of Hickman Community Church? Refusing to gossip, seeking unity and peace, respectfully following, trusting, and supporting the God-ordained leaders of this church, and graciously accepting reproof and repenting of sin in accordance with church discipline, as outlined in Matthew 18? Yes. And will you share in the responsibilities of church life by praying for its leaders, its growth, boldly sharing the gospel with the unbeliever, and warmly welcoming visitors and strangers to the church? And finally, will you serve the ministry of the church through the sacrificial exercise of your gifts and talents by equipping and being equipped to serve in the body and by developing a servant heart for Christ? Yes. Very good. Now I'd ask the current members of Hickman Community Church if you would please stand and please affirm the following questions with a joyful answer of yes. Having heard the desire of Micah to become a member of Hickman Community Church, do you, the current members, covenant before God to embrace him in the love and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. And do you covenant to pray for his spiritual growth, to serve, share, and give of yourselves unreservedly to the building up of his faith in the Lord Jesus? Yes. And will you extend to him the right hand of Christian fellowship, humbly loving him, as Christ has loved you. Yes. Amen. You may be seated. Josh Taylor is going to pray for Micah. Please uh, bow with me in prayer. Oh God, you are so good to us. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for Micah's faith in your son as his Lord and Savior. Thank you for his obedience to you and his commitment to this local body of your people. Please strengthen your servant Micah in his time here with us. May he increase in his knowledge and his devotion and most of all, his love for you. May he find freedom and great joy in using his gifts among us, not only for the good of our sanctification, but for Micah's greatest pleasure and the head of the church, Jesus Christ's highest praise. May you firmly establish him in this place and enable him to bear much fruit for your glory. And then all of God's people said, amen. Well, now we'd like to ask uh, Brother Bill Richards to come up and to turn our attention to the word and to prayer. Bill, would you come up and open the word to us? Good morning, Hickman Church. Would you stand with me as we turn to Psalm, the one, Psalm 144? We'll be reading verses 1 through 15, 
And in this psalm, David, as he so often does, turns to the Lord, his rock, for deliverance in times of trouble. Most notably, we see him pause in the midst of his petition to ask the truly wondrous question, what is man that you take knowledge of him? Or as the message version puts it, I wonder why you care, God. Why do you bother with us at all? May we hear the heart of David this morning as he considers the glory of his God, and may we know the heart of God as he delights to give his people his unmerited favor. Join me as we read Psalm 144, verses 1 through 15. A Psalm of David. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle, my loving kindness and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. O Lord, what is man that you take knowledge of him, or the son of man that you think of him? Man is like a mere breath. His days are like a passing shadow. Bow your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains that they may smoke. Flash forth lightning and scatter them. Send out your arrows and confuse them. Stretch forth your hand from on high. Rescue me and deliver me out of great waters, out of the hand of aliens whose mouths speak deceit and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. I will sing a new song to you, O God. Upon a harp of ten strings, I will sing praises to you who gives salvation to kings, who rescues David his servant from the evil sword. Rescue me and deliver me out of the hand of aliens whose mouth speaks deceit and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. Let our sons in their youth be as grown-up plants and our daughters as corner pillars fashioned as for a palace. Let our garners be full, furnishing every kind of produce, and our flocks bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields. Let our cattle bear without mishap and without loss. Let there be no outcry in our streets. How blessed are the people who are so situated. How blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. You may be seated. This is the word of the Lord. Let us go to our Father in heaven in prayer. Holy God, Heavenly Father, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in unity. This morning we, your children, gather in this place to live out that unity, a unity that is only found in our common identity as redeemed sinners purchased through the blood of our Savior Jesus Christ. It is of little value to speak of that unity as a feature of our theology. It is of glorious value to return week after week to do life together in a way that discernibly manifests that precious gift of grace a unity that transcends the diversity and differences of all whom you've called to life within your body, the church, a unity that stands in stunning contrast to the relational dysfunctions of the culture around us with its brokenness, its divisions, its strife. As David wisely did, we too turn to you, Father, our rock, our fortress, our refuge, we dare not be foolish in believing that we in ourselves are strong, that we are in any way immune to the sinful seductions of the surrounding culture. Your word warns us that our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Through the powerful agency of your Holy Spirit, giving us an alert and sober spirit, may we not leave ourselves open to attack as is our constant prayer, we ask that you strengthen our leaders, your raised up shepherds, to watch over your flock here in Hickman, that we might thrive for your glory 
and for your reputation in our community and beyond. David reminds us that man is like a mere breath. His days are like a passing shadow. So we dare not waste this morning's opportunity to worship you, the only true God. We return this morning to the graces that you provided your church, precious graces that the Holy Spirit will use to strengthen us as we've requested. We will raise our voices in joyful songs saturated with the glorious truths of your gospel. We will open your scriptures given to us that we might in them know your heart in order that we might live according to your righteous ways. We will engage our brothers and sisters in words and deeds that allow your spirit-given grace of unity to grow and spread among us. And may you receive all of this as a fragrant offering because we love you, Lord. And it is in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our righteous brother and true King, that we pray. Amen. Let us praise the Lord together that though we were in darkness, though his glory was hid from our eyes by that darkness, he is stronger than the darkness and has in Christ brought us to live in his glorious light. Please stand and raise your voices in praise with us.
Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness.
to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose, and let my song forever. Christ, the light of the world who is shown in to darkness. Lord, we thank you that although we were children of darkness, Lord, by your light, Lord, we have seen our sin before a holy God. Lord, by your mercy, you have drawn us to repentance. Lord, in Christ, you have forgiveness of, forgiven us of our sin. Lord, and you have graced us with your word and your spirit to enable us to walk in the light as children of the light. We are so undeserving, unworthy. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being called by your name, of beholding you for who you are. Lord, of calling you and singing to you as our God. Lord, we ask that our lives would reflect your light into a darkened world, that we might be a city shining brightly on a hill for your glory. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated, and children, you may be dismissed to your classes. Please open your Bibles with me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We come in our study of John's gospel to the verses after the verse. Last week we studied those most incredible words of the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3.16. If John 3.16 is the most well-known and most beloved verses in the Bible, the verses that come after it are not lesser loved, simply probably lesser known. But the verses that come after 316 are needed verses. They give a context and they give a fullness to what John 316 says. They don't change its message, but they do amplify and extend what was already said. Things said here are perhaps more explicitly articulated, but this is not new information. This passage here, really 16 through 21, comes on the heels of Jesus' conversation with Nick at night. That is Nicodemus, that Jewish religious leader. And I trust this has been a helpful instruction, helpful section to instruct you on salvation. The section that we're looking at began in verse 1, and verses 1 through 15 really describe a conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. And Jesus describes the necessity of the new birth and of having true saving faith. In that conversation, Jesus stated the requirement for entrance into heaven, entrance into the kingdom of God, is to be born again. It's not that we are only born once and then we can enter. No, it is that we must be born again. A spiritual birth 
A birth from above must occur. In that section, Jesus also alluded to an Old Testament story about snakes biting people. This comes from Numbers 21, and the connection he was making between this story about snakes biting people is the connection with the need to have personal faith. Remember, we looked at that a number of weeks ago. The Israelites who were bit were being healed as they looked at a bronze serpent that was lifted up on a pole for all to see. They had faith in that lifted up serpent, and they were healed. Jesus then predicted that he himself, the Son of Man, would also likewise be lifted up so that all who look with faith would be healed spiritually and gain eternal life. So therefore, just as the Israelites were to have simple and desperate faith in God's appointed means of salvation, so we likewise are to turn to God's appointed means of salvation in simple and desperate faith. Beginning in 3.16, we've begun to hear of the voice, uh, from the voice of John, John the author. John is giving his theological explanation of salvation. The first part was a conversation. This is now an explanation. And in your Bibles, if you have a red letter version, the red letters keep going from 15 through 21. But I do think there's good reason for us to see this as John giving an explanation of the theology of salvation. Here he describes and defines the work of Christ in salvation. And so in these two sections, a conversation and followed by an explanation, we have both those twin truths about how man is saved. That is to say, man is saved because because of the divine sovereignty of God, but also combining with man's responsibility. When it comes to salvation, we have that mysterious combination of the divine sovereignty of God over his salvation with the call for man and the responsibility of you and I to come to faith in Christ. These two truths are here back to back. This is on purpose, of course, and this is a perfect harmony of the theology of salvation. God must act bringing new birth, and we must believe, we must trust in Jesus Christ for our salvation. So I'm going to start reading in verses 17 through 21. That's what we'll look at this morning, but please follow along as I do so. John 3, 17 says, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed." But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. This morning we're going to look at and see at how John summarizes this teaching about salvation uh, by answering four questions. So we're looking at four questions and answers about salvation from John 3, 17 through 21. I'll state them for you before we go through them. Number one is, why did God send His Son into the world? Question two, why then are men condemned? Question three, why, why do men not believe? And question four, in what two ways do men respond to the light of Christ? Perhaps you have heard it said that the Bible is not just a book that you read, but it's a book that reads you. And I think you will find that to be very true in the passage that we will look at this morning because it reads us like a book. So the first question that John answers, I'll put it this way, why did God send his son into the world? Verse 17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So the answer, why did God send his son into the world? That was to, it is to save the world, not to condemn it. 
Verse 17 begins with the word for, showing us that it is picking up on the previous and giving now an explanation, a further explanation of what has been said. John is making a simple point, a point of clarification, not that there was any confusion in verse 16, but he's giving a greater clarification on the purpose of the mission of Jesus. This is about the mission of Jesus Christ. God loved the world and God gave the world his son. God did not send his son to judge, but to save. Jesus came into the world. We, you and I know that Jesus is from heaven. He came in this world, and at Christmas we celebrate his birth, but really we celebrate his incarnation, the fact that he came into the world. He is from the outside, but he came into the inside. He isn't from around here, but we can say he became a local, as it were. But John starts with a negative here in saying, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world. When we see the word judge, we can understand that as condemn, as condemn. To make a judgment is to make a separation. It's to make a division. It's, it's to divide. Here, the emphasis is on condemnation. Christ Jesus, John is saying, did not come into the world to bring condemnation to us. He came into the world to bring salvation. We must not forget that when Jesus came into the world, he did not come into a neutral world. He didn't come to a place that was still thinking through God's truth and trying to figure out what, what they wanted to do. No, Jesus Christ came into a lost and dying world full of sin and enmity against their creator. Romans 5.12 says, through one man, that is Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin. John's point is that Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world. God could condemn the world, God should condemn the world, and God will condemn the world, though. God could condemn the world and everyone in it. Remember, he flooded the world once as an act of condemnation. He saved eight people whom he delivered from the waters of his judgment. But God could have come to condemn the world. He is capable of doing that. We could also say that God did not send Christ to condemn the world, but God should condemn the world and everyone in it. He should condemn the world and everyone in it. That's because we are all culpable due to our sin. We have dishonored God. We have not obeyed his laws. We have rejected his wisdom, his counsel, and sought our own glory and not his. And so therefore, we have to understand that God should condemn the world. In fact, one of the things you have to understand, if you would be saved, is that you should be judged. If you do not think you should be judged, then why in the world would you think that you therefore need salvation? So a part of understanding the gospel is understanding that God could condemn the world, and in fact, He should condemn the world. He is fully capable of doing it, and you and I are fully culpable in our sin and rebellion to God. The reality is that at a future time, God will condemn the world. Scripture teaches us that He destroyed the world by water at one time, but He will destroy the world by fire the next time. But right now, right now is a day of grace. Right now is a day when, when, uh, when salvation is offered to you. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Saved through him. We always must remember that salvation was and is his idea. There is salvation in Christ. We often speak about being saved, but how, oft, how often do we think about what that actually means or what it is that we're actually saying? R.C. Sproul, that famous theologian who died a few years ago, before he was a believer, he was walking around on a college campus, and somebody came up to him and asked him and said, hey, are you saved? Are you saved? Now, his first thought as a non-believer was saved from what? Saved from what? He even wrote a book famously by that title, Saved 
from what? And he argues in that book that the question should actually be phrased this way or asked in response, are you saved? Not necessarily saved from what, but saved from whom? Because that's the reality of what's going on in salvation. The answer, are you saved? You're saved from whom? Saved from God. Saved from God himself. God in his righteous wrath stands against us in our sin. So what are you saved from or whom are you saved from? You are saved from God. God saves you from God. Now, we must be careful as we think about that statement and we think about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We must not think that God the Father wants to judge everyone, but God the Son, He's the compassionate one and He wants to protect everyone and save everyone. That's not the way that it works. That's not what the Scriptures teach. God the Son saves you from God the Father, true, because God the Father sent God the Son to rescue man from God the Father's own judgment. That's why it says, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world. Jesus Christ is the sent one. You will see that in John's gospel over and over. He is the sent one sent by the Father. So the Father, out of his mercy, sends the Son who in mercy provides salvation to rescue you and me from the wrath that is to come. So when we think about salvation, when we think about being saved, we're saved from God, but we're also saved for God and to God. We're saved through him. We're saved through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ isn't pointing to anyone else. Jesus Christ didn't come to tell us about the good works we can do to get saved. Jesus Christ didn't come to give us a leg up. Jesus Christ didn't come to point us to a ladder. He is the ladder to God. Only Jesus Christ saves us. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. God was in Christ reconciling, bringing peace with the world to himself. Only God can save you from God. That's why God sent his son into the world to save, not to condemn. Second question, second question is this, why then are men condemned? If Jesus saves, if Jesus came to bring salvation and not condemnation, why then are men condemned? Look at 18. John 3, 18 says, He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So answer to the question, why then are, are men condemned? They do not believe in Jesus Christ. It's as though John here is bringing us into the courtroom of heaven where we stand on trial before the supreme judge. And this is a very quick proceeding. We do not await a verdict because the verdict is already in and the verdict handed down is guilty because of sin. John explains, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. As we have said, sin entered the world through one man, and then all men have sinned. So we are condemned by inheriting Adam's sin nature, and then we are condemned because we sin ourselves. We sin against the will of God in thought, in word, and in deed. God requires perfection, but we failed in every way. We've broken his law. We've despised his glory. The text, the text says here that men are condemned because they do not believe. We're condemned because we have a sin nature. We're condemned because we do not obey the will and the law of God. And we are condemned because we do not believe. He says, he who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe in Jesus, believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
The only begotten Son of God is, of course, Christ Jesus. And when it says name, it's referring to all that Jesus is, all that he is, his person and his work, that he is the Son of God from heaven, sent to the cross to make payment for sin, who rose victoriously from the grave in resurrection glory. So we are condemned if we do not believe in his name. To disbelieve, think about it, to disbelieve what, what, who, who Christ is and what Christ has brought is to reject kind's, God's kind offer of salvation. To disbelieve in Christ is to dishonor God who sent forth his son who needs to be honored, who must be honored. To disbelieve in Christ is to call Jesus Christ a liar who said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There's an escape here. However, from the judgment and the escape is he who believes is not judged. It's not by works that we're saved, but it's by faith. No one is saved without believing. Those who have faith, Romans 8, 1 says, are not condemned. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who escape from the judgment of God are those who have faith, those who have a saving faith, not a mere intellectual faith that says, I understand who Jesus is and I believe some facts, but a self-denying trust, a confidence placed in Jesus Christ and submission to him. That's the offer of escape. But to those who do not believe, the scripture says, the judgment has been passed. A final day of judgment is coming, but the judgment already is standing there. John 3.36 says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John is telling us judgment is there already resting. Judgment is there hovering over the sinner like a vulture circling over its prey waiting to partake. Judgment is already resting upon the, con- the sinner like a condemned criminal that's sitting on death row just awaiting final, ex- final execution, just awaiting the court's timing. Judgment rests upon those who reject Christ. Judgment is come, but judgment, judgment will come, but judgment is resting now. He says those who disbelieve are judged already. Isaac Watts wrote, look down, O Lord, with pitying eye and save the soul condemned to die. Do you see that you are condemned to die? Then go to Christ. Go to Jesus Christ. There's a third question that's addressed here about salvation. Why do men not believe? If believing is key, and believing in Christ will remove one from the sentence of condemnation, why then do men still not believe? The answer is this. They love darkness. They love darkness. Look at verse 19. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. John is saying this is how it works. This is the judgment. It says the light has come into the world. In the New American Standard, the word light is capitalized, showing and pointing out that this is a reference to Jesus Christ. For John to say light has come into the world, he's not talking about truth has come into the world, but truth came into the world at the beginning when God created the world. So when it says light has come into the world, he's saying that when Jesus Christ came into the world, that is the light he's talking about. The light of God's truth has been in the world since the beginning, but only Jesus has brought the fullest revelation of God to the world. It's in himself. It says men loved the darkness. The darkness is a reference to sin. The darkness is a reference to the life that lives out of that sinful heart that rejects the truth. The darkness rejects the light of Christ in his purity, in his holiness, in his goodness. And it says there, men loved the darkness. Certainly the offer of salvation is a good good offer. 
Here's Christ, believe in him. So why won't men believe? He puts it there in the realm of desires, in the heart, in the internal desires here. Men loved darkness rather than the light. That is to say, they preferred it and continually prefer it. This is to say they prefer the darkness as opposed to the light. Not to say they they prefer darkness more than the light, but rather the light is not loved at all. Let me put it to you this way. I could say to you, I prefer chocolate ice cream to vanilla. Subtly there, you would understand, I like chocolate, but vanilla has some value. I'm okay with vanilla. But the text is not simply saying there is a a, a preference that's made, I like one, better than the other. It's like saying this, I despise vanilla ice cream and will only eat chocolate ice cream. I'm using that illustration just to make the point. This is about the darkness and what they love. They love the darkness rather than the light. They don't want the light. They hate the light. The natural man prefers the darkness of their sins rather than the light of Christ. The Scripture speaks highly of love. Love. But the Scriptures also warn of evil, illicit love. 1 John 2, 15 and 16 says, Do not love. Don't love what? Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So there cannot be two loves there, a love of the world and a love of the Father. If anyone loves the world, love of the Father isn't there. Verse 16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The one who loves darkness loves the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. The non-believer doesn't want Christ, does not want Christ and his light but rather loves the lust of their own flesh and to indulge in the desires of their flesh. The non-believer is a friend of the world and therefore, as James 4, 4 says, makes himself an enemy of God. Romans 8, 7 says, because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God for it does not subject itself to the law of God. The natural man does not love what God loves. The natural man hates what God loves and loves God that which God hates. 1 John 2, 17 says, the world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. I love what John Piper said on this verse. He said, if you love the world, it will pass away and take you with it. This is the sentence of condemnation. This is how it works works here. Light, Jesus Christ, has come into the world, bringing light in the knowledge of the truth and the glory of God. But sinners choose the darkness, and their condemnation lies in that very fact. That shows us that the issue is not ignorance. The issue with sinful man is not ignorance. The issue is sin. This is about love. This has to do with loves. Now do you see why we say saving faith is not merely intellectual? This is about loves. The sinner loved the darkness rather than the light. Do you see here there's a need then, therefore, for new desires and new loves? We need God to grant this to us. While God loved the world, man loved his dark deeds. Question number four. In what two ways do men respond to the light of Christ? In what two ways do men respond to the light of Christ? The answer is this. They avoid him or approach him. They reject him or they engage him. Verses 20 and 21, John says this. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. There are these different responses because the light reveals. Light reveals. 
Notice here, verse 20 starts with four, showing us that he's building on the logic that came out of 19. We'll look at this first. The the non-believer here avoids the light. It says everyone who does evil hates the light. That's more explicit than what was just said. I mentioned that in verse 19, but he explicitly says it here. The darkness hates the light. The one who does evil hates the light. I mentioned to you 1 John 2 and how John summarizes the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. Paul describes the last days and the sort of evil that we will see. John says here, everyone who does evil hates the light. The doing of evil, Paul describes it this way, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 4 says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's a painful list to hear, but that's the overflow of the human heart, the dark human heart that doesn't want the light, but actually hates the light because their deeds are evil. They avoid Christ. They seem allergic, allergic to Christ. When Christ was on this earth, he was hated. He was hated particularly by the Pharisees and by the Sadducees. They were jealous of him and his popularity. They were envious of him, but they hated him also because he exposed them for the frauds that they were. He exposed them and their need for salvation, which they didn't see. Why doesn't the one in the darkness come to the light of Christ? Because the light always exposes. And there's a fear of being exposed. Sin is shameful. Sin is shameful. You know that. I know that. Sin is shameful. Every sinner knows that sin is shameful. You remember Adam and Eve, after they sinned, what did they do? They went and hid. They put clothes on themselves to try to cover themselves. They were exposed. But what do sinners try to do? The same thing as Adam and Eve did. They try to hide. Sinners try to hide their sin, disguise their sin, rename their sin. Sinners reject the truth and suppress the truth in unrighteousness to keep their sins hidden. They pretend their sins do not exist. The sinner will call on the government to legislate their own immorality, to appease their conscience. The sinner will come up with creative slogans to help them think that what they're doing isn't in fact wrong, but it's, it's a right thing to do. So you hear creative slogans like, my body, my choice, or love is love, or only God can judge me. These are only clever little schemes to help the non-believer ease their afflicted conscience. But these are only like cough drops to help someone with a scorching throat from tonsillitis. The sinner loving their sin is like a child in the midst of their burning bedroom that covers their ears so they don't hear the sirens blaring and covering, covers their eyes so they don't see the yellow flames licking up and burning the room that they're in. The non-believer has a willful deafness and a willful blindness. The non-believer hates the light and doesn't come to the light. Again, verse 20, he doesn't come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. In the last century, British preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones preached on five reasons why mankind hates the light of the gospel. And he put it this way, mankind hates the light of the gospel because it prohibits the sins we desire to commit. He said, mankind hates the light of the gospel because it awakens and disturbs our consciences. Number three, because it gives us a sense of condemnation and we don't like it. Number four, it hurts our pride. Number five, it reminds us of death and the judgment. Mankind does not want the light. You ever wonder why you invite people to church? They say, I got a great church. I think you say that. They say, come to church. And they don't come to church. Why don't they come to church? Well, they'll tell you the reason. 
And the reason is they're busy. Well, we take the grandkids out for breakfast on Sunday. Oh, we make pancakes in the morning. Oh, we've got an activity. We've got an event. We've got a family deal here. No, you've made yourself busy. People don't come to church because they don't want the light. They'll be exposed. You ever say, hey, why don't you try reading the Bible? And someone says, well, I, you know, I, I don't really have time to read the Bible. Or, you know, I don't think the Bible's true because there's not enough evidence for that. No, that's not the case. That's not the case. You don't read the Bible because you don't want the Bible to point out your sin. There's a fear of exposure. That's why the non-believer doesn't come to Christ. That's why I said the Bible is not just a book that you read. It's a book that reads you. Why don't people come to Christ? They don't want to be exposed because if they're exposed, they're going to have to deal with their sin. And repentance is the only way that we can deal with our sin. That is, turn from our sin and trust in Jesus Christ. Exposure to the light of Christ is avoided at all costs by the non-believer. Steve Lawson said, more sad than a child afraid of the dark is an adult afraid of the light. Well, I ask this question, what are the two ways that men respond to the light? The first is avoid. The second, I would say, is approach, engage, draw near. Verse 21 is a great contrast with verse 20. He says, but, but he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. So there's a contrast here. Those who avoid Christ and those who approach Christ. I want you to understand here what John is doing in verse 21 is not talking about getting saved. John isn't talking about how to become a child of God. He's not talking about it, that in this text. He says, he who practices the truth comes to the light. If we take comes to the light as salvation, then we're saying that they're practicing the truth before they actually are saved and therefore can practice the truth. So what John 3.21 is dealing with here is the believer, the one who's been born again by Christ Jesus. How do they live? How do they walk? It's not how to get saved. It's how saved people act towards Christ, or it's why people come to church, or it's why people read the Bible. He says there, the people are described as practicing the truth. This implies they first know the truth. And if they know the truth and have it in their minds and hearts, they believe it, but they don't just leave it there. They have a saving faith. A saving faith, meaning they don't hear merely, they do the truth. There's an ongoing lifestyle of following after the truth, practicing the truth. The Christian is someone, someone who no longer lives in defiance of Christ, but now lives in obedience to Christ. Again, this is not coming to salvation, but this is possessing salvation. John says the believer comes to the light to show off. Walk with me on this. The believer comes to the light to show off, not as a peacock spreads their feathers and prances around in pride. That's not why the believer comes to the light continually. The believer comes for a show. It says there, he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Another way to say that is having been done through God, or we are in union with him and therefore the deeds are done by his power. So that's why I say the Christian comes to Christ with Christ or is with Christ to show off, and that is to say to show off God. Because you know this isn't about showing off anything that you've done. It says, he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested or revealed as having been wrought in God. So you say, why do I do this? Why do I practice the truth and obey Christ? I obey Christ because I'm connected to Christ because of what he's done in my life. And so my good works are a manifestation of the fact that God is working his good work in 
me. There is no room for pride in the Christian life. There's no room for pride at all. Paul even said in Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. The, the believer embraces Christ continually, practicing the truth, doing what the truth says. That's why the believer loves to fellowship, whether it's Sunday or any day. I want to be with the believers. That's why the believer reads the scriptures. That's why the believer seeks accountability. That's why the believer longs to be with Christ. And exposure will take place. And deeds will be exposed. And the credit should go all to the Lord. That's why the believer here comes to Christ. Well, the passage we've looked at here has laid out two types of people in the world. Those who are inside the kingdom and those who are outside the kingdom. Those who believe in Jesus Christ and those who do not believe in Jesus Christ. Those who are not condemned by him and those that are. Those that, who love Christ and his light and those who hate Christ, those who depart from their spiritual darkness and practice the truth, and those who remain in it, those who are saved by Christ, and those who are perishing, those who are born again to new life, and those who are simply born of the flesh and will die. There's no middle ground in this text. There's no middle ground in the scriptures. Dear friend, where do you find yourself today? Where do you find yourself today? If you find yourself outside of the kingdom, the call today is to trust in Christ. The call is today, come to Christ. If you realize that you stand condemned before a holy God, cry out to him. Ask him for his mercy. He will be merciful to those who believe. Your only hope is found in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the savior of sinners. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You are holy, righteous, pure. We have failed, we have sinned, we have rejected you. But in your kindness and in your mercy, you sent your Son to save wicked sinners from your own judgment. Christ appeases your own wrath, O oh God. Thank you for that wonder. I pray for all who are hearing this scripture today. I pray that they would recognize the sin in their life and bring it to you. As Proverbs 28, 13 says, he who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find mercy. May there be those who find mercy this day. In Christ's name we ask, amen. We once were in darkness, but there is blessing walking in the light in the Lord. Please stand and let us sing this truth together as we close our time.
if he's forgiven you and you have fellowship with him. You need not fear him and fear his punishment anymore. You fear him as you do with reverence and respect. I want to pray for our offering and then I'll dismiss you with a benediction. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, this world is passing away as John has told us. Its desires are passing away. And right now we have an opportunity both to come to Christ in faith but also to continue to come to Christ and use the resources that you've given to us to be a blessing and spread the message of salvation alone through Jesus Christ. I pray for the offering as it is given today. Would you enable us to use those funds wisely to build up the body of Christ here and to send out those who would proclaim the gospel and even be a beacon of of truth that draws people in to hear the words of Christ. So bless those who give and bless as we disperse those funds for your ministry, for your sake, O God, not for our glory, but yours alone. And at the end of the day, we will say we came to the light to show that our deeds have been wrought or done by and through you. All praise to you, O Father, through Christ's name I ask, amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. You are dismissed.